Nowadays, more and more companies are relying uh, on APM and WebDriver to build custom frameworks to test their web and mobile applications. And um, as you know, there are many flaky tests. And usually the reason for that is that we don't treat our test code as a production code. Moreover, we don't treat our frameworks as products. And um, this is what I will talk about today. Uh, you'll get lots of insights, how you can test your uh, test automation frameworks. Um, and I'll give you examples uh, from our own. First, uh, who am I? I'm Anton Angelov. I, came, uh, I come from Bulgaria. I have uh, eight years of experience in the field of automation testing. I worked as a QA architect uh, in two big companies in Bulgaria, and part of my job was to write and design scalable test automation solutions. Meanwhile, I was working as a consultant as well and led many trainings. So, uh, here's our agenda. First, uh, we'll get through some definitions. What is the difference between a library, a framework, and test automation framework? Then, um, I will tell you more about our framework so that you can understand the context and uh, I will share with you what tools do we use to release it, to test it, um, about uh, a little bit about our branching strategy. And uh, later on, the second part of the presentation will be about the different types of testing we do to make sure that our framework is working correctly. Let's begin. So first, what is a software library like WebDriver? It is generally consisting of uh, pre-written code, like classes, methods, data definition, files, constants, etc., that you can use um, later on in your own code without explicitly writing it the code again. Basically, we reuse the code. Here on the slide, you can find an example from, uh, uh, this is actually a .NET code, the daytime library in .NET. This is a library. The framework is something more generic and more abstract. Usually, you can override and customize its behavior by overriding some of the methods. And there are four major things that uh, make the framework different from the library. The first one is inversion of control. And here, I'm not talking about inversion of control containers. Rather, uh, usually, the framework is controlling the flow of the program rather than the user. Uh, the, usually, the user is controlling the flow in the libraries then the framework usually provides uh, a useful default behavior. Also, uh, you can extend the framework, meaning, as I told you, you can uh, do it in uh, several ways. You can override some of the methods. Uh, some frameworks uh, provide delegates or hooks which you can subscribe on, or you can use template design pattern, template method design pattern, and so on. And lastly, you can extend and customize the code, but you cannot modify it. What about the test automation framework? It's a bit, a bit different than the software framework. Um, for example, imagine that you have a custom framework using underneath APM or WebDriver. Usually, we use page objects. For the page objects, you usually put them in separate projects from the tests. But you need to pick one type of page object. What I mean is that you can there like at least 10 different types of page objects you can use. For example, uh, you can define the elements as uh, pr private. You can expose them as public properties. You can spread the elements through different files and use them in the page object, and so on and so on. So you need to pick one particular type of page object. Then you are talking with your colleagues, and you decide that instead of writing pure unit tests, you want to use BDD syntax, like Gherkin. And then you install, for example, for .NET specfall. And as you know, for Gherkin, in order to work, it needs to have these coded uh, steps. So you put them in a different project. And of course, you need to have one more project to put your spec files in the tests. Later on, one month after that, you decide with your colleagues that you need some kind of a coding standards so that your team shared uh, like a high quality coding standards and you're notified. And because of that, you install for the .NET uh, a tool such as StyleCop or Editor Config. And you need to define this kind of coding rules inside a specific file. So as you can see, 
the test automation framework is not only about the methods and classes you use, it's about the different rules, patterns, etc., that you need to follow, the following guidelines. This is the test automation framework, all of these things. Next, uh, as you know, one of the seven principles uh, in testing is the context, meaning that uh, in order to understand what type of testing we do, I need to, sh to share with you what we do. Um, we develop a test automation framework written in .NET in C-sharp. We use .NET Core so that it's cross-platform, meaning you can write and execute the test on different plat platforms such as Windows, Linux, Mac. Uh, we have different uh, modules for testing web, uh, and Android, iOS, desktop, uh, API, and wall testing. And of course, underneath, we use WebDriver, Appium, WinApp Driver, S-sharp, and so on. Uh, there are um, two ways how you can use the framework. Usually, a uh, big part of our users use the framework as NuGet packages. This is the packaging platform for .NET. Um, in order to make the usage easier, uh, we developed a UI installer so that it configures all of the projects for you. Uh, but it's like uh, it's working on Windows. And in order this to work, we created common line installer for Mac and Linux. And the second way of using uh, the tool is uh, actually how our enterprise users use it because they have the source code. And uh, there we removed all of the licensing checks, like all security checks actually. Because uh, later on I will tell you that, uh, for example, we use third party tools to obfuscate all of the DLLs so that nobody can like reverse engineer what we do. So. Now, about our test infrastructure. Uh, mainly, right now, uh, all of our um, continuous integration jobs are placed in Azure DevOps. Before that, uh, we actually use a combination between Jenkins and Allure. Uh, if you don't know Allure, it's like a test reporting portal. Uh, however, we stopped using Jenkins because uh, we had many test agent machines. And uh, we use like these Jenkins uh, agents, but they keep disconnecting. And because of all of these troubles, uh, we move to Azure, which is much more stable and its agents. And about the Allure, it had some integration with Azure, but since it's third party, it was not working very well. And because of that, we switched to using uh, the built-in functionality in Azure to visualize the results. This is a really nice. Uh, test results dashboarding, like uh, you can see the uh, time for each build, uh, you can see the detailed reports about each test, uh, and also if you use MS test or any unit, you can attach, for example, videos and screenshots to each of the tests. What else? Uh, I told you that um, in production, uh, most of our users use the framework as NuGet packages. We upload them to NuGet org. However, since we uh, strive to make uh, major releases each month or two, we cannot upload our current development NuGet packages to NuGet org since like, our current development will go live. Because of that, we created a test feed in MyGet. This is like a private NuGet feed. Uh, this is uh, de facto our test environment where, where uh, our current development is there and our tests are running against it. Uh, something else, uh, most of our tests, like we have over 5,000 system tests verifying that the framework is working correctly. Uh, these tests are usually running uh, on Windows machines, like uh, several of them. However, as mentioned, we promised that our solution should be cross-platform. Uh, and in order to support that, we bought a machine uh, Mac machine in the cloud, there is such a service. Instead of buying a physical machine, we just buy uh, virtual machines in the cloud, where we run all of these tests again, but on Mac. And you'll be surprised how many problems there are, and .NET Core is not really out of the box running uh, on Mac. Uh, so you need to test that. What about our branching strategy? Uh, we use uh, the built-in uh, Git support in Azure. So our primary source control system is Git. Uh, we have a couple of branches. First, 
we have this release branch, which is actually our master. This is what is our production code. Uh, then when, when we make sure that the current release is stable, the code goes there in the release. Then we check our roadmap and we ask our users what are the most three top features that they want from us. And we pick them and start a new branch. For example, uh, we pick the most prominent feature of these three and name the branch uh, on it. For example, wall testing release five. So for the next month or two, the current development is happening in this particular branch. But since uh, as every like uh, wife product, we need to make sure that uh, we make bug fixes every day. And uh, if there is, uh, for example, a new version of Apium or WebDriver to support particular Android version or new browser, we need to update it and make sure that everything is working. So we have this maintenance branch where we put all of these fixes, etc. And when we make sure and run all of the tests against this branch and everything is working with the fixes, then we merge it with the release branch and make a release. And this may happen every day or when it's necessary. Uh, this is like a service pack releases. Um, and the last branch that we have is the so-called enterprise edition branch where, uh, as I told you, uh, we removed all, uh, for example, licensing checks, obfuscation, and so on. But since uh, it's semi-automated merge, we need to make sure that, uh, like again, run all of the tests against this particular branch again. Because even uh, since the users are not using the framework as packages when they have the, uh, the source code, they just reference the projects. Because of that, we have a spare set of tests against it. And the last one, infrastructure share, is actually not a branch. It's a complete new repository where uh, we put uh, all of the different, for example, we have different, our own packages for distributing the drivers for web driver for each different browser set. Uh, we have demo applications for uh, testing desktop apps, for, uh, we have demo applications for Android, for iOS. Uh, we have, a, for example, common line video recorder and so on. We put all of these executables uh, in this particular repository, uh, not in the main repository because if we put it in the main repository, this means that all of our builds will get slower and slower over time because of the history of these big executables. And, uh, but we want to keep the history of them. Because of that, we have uh, this separate repository. Um, as you will see later on, we have uh, lots of integrations with Visual Studio and different IDEs to make the work with the framework easier. Uh, so we have, for example, project templates, item templates for page objects, uh, snippets for faster writing, um, and all of these NuGet packages. And like the product itself is uh, containing many moving parts. And we strive uh, to automate the release of everything and not do it manually because of the human errors. Uh, because of that, we created uh, like a release application, we called it release manager. Uh, it, this is the UI version, but we have a common line version as well so that we can uh, put it in uh, build definitions. Uh, its primary job is to, for example, build all of the projects automatically. Then it called the third party tools to obfuscate the DLLs. Then packages everything into like more than 100 different packages. It can deploy the packages to the different environments and so on and so on. Many complex things, but the main thing here is that we strive to automate all of this stuff and not do it manually because, because of the human errors, most of the bugs are happening because of them. Now, uh, let's talk about the different test types that we do. First, of course, the functional testing. Uh, in order to test the functional testing here, uh, we have, as I mentioned, uh, our own demo applications. For example, for web, we have created mock pages instead of live pages supported somewhere so that our tests are uh, like running quite fast. For Android and for iOS, we have separate uh, like native and uh, hybrid applications that we test against. For the API, which is like web service testing, we have a like a common line deployable web service which runs a again with the tests. So you get the point. But here, um, 
as you know, in APM and uh, in WebDriver, usually when you find an element, it, it's represented like with the iWeb element interface or like it's a single class or interface. Uh, in our framework, each control is a different class, uh, providing different methods for usability purposes, like uh, making the code a little bit uh, easier to use, more readable, etc. And uh, this is definitely something that we need to test, like here, uh, on the slide, you can see this uh, date element. This is like a data picker where we call this set date method and we choose the date. And we need to make sure that this is working correctly. Next, uh, like uh, functional testing we do is that uh, as with any good program in practice, if something uh, is going wrong, we throw appropriate exception message containing information what went wrong and what you need to do to fix the problem. But again, this is something that you need to test, whether it's working, because it's custom code in the framework. Uh, if you recall the definition what the framework is, one, I, I think the, the major thing about the frameworks is that they need to allow you to customize and extend the code. So this is uh, such functionality. For example, for each uh, method uh, in our framework, we uh, give extensibility points to put your own code, for example, before setting the date, after setting the date, and you can write something like a plugins. But this is definitely, again, something that we need to verify that it's working. If you have used, uh, for example, I, I think the interface was uh, firing WebDriver, it's something similar, providing you an interface for extending uh, WebDriver. Another way how to, you can extend the framework is uh, like, uh, for example, here, uh, if you don't like how our um, implementation is done, for example, how you get the date, uh, we provided a way how you can override uh, the behavior at all uh, in particular tests or globally in all tests. And again, this is something that, you, that we need to verify. Otherwise, there might be regression bugs during our development. Sometimes, uh, like uh, again, we have lots of unit tests. So here you can see one unit test. We have this functionality called BDD logging, which is based on the extendability points uh, I showed you before. But instead of running emulators, simulators, and browsers, we just mock the, our logger and verify that uh, it's logging uh, the thing that it should be. Um, uh, another thing that we do is that basically, for for example, this is an uh, example for Android. As you know, uh, if you search for an element in Android, and uh, for example, if the element is here, it's not visible on the screen, uh, and if you're trying to search it, uh, if you don't write some custom code, your test will fail. So there is a custom code using Appium that can scroll down or scroll up until it finds the element on the screen. And we uh, developed the framework uh, to hide this complexity and to allow users just to write, for example, create by ID containing. And the framework is, is doing the scrolling automatically for you. But again, this is some custom low level Appium code that it's under the hood and we need to verify that it's working. So this is a test where I know that the element that I'm searching is below the visibility point and I check that it's visible. Warning tests. Warning tests are something uh, interesting. Yeah, they're like um, special tests that don't test the framework itself or the product itself. They can be used to test um, different third-party dependencies in your application. Meaning that, for example, uh, in our case, we use WebDriver and APM under the hood. But as you know, during time, there are updates of the WebDriver or uh, APM. And we are humans, it's open source projects, sometimes there are bugs, something is not working on the new Android versions or the API is changed. And we need to make sure that this compatibility between the framework and APM or WebDriver is working in, and continues to work. To make uh, this decision uh, easier for us to choose whether we need to upgrade the framework or not, <laughs> we have this separate project where we just call the APM the way we 
call it uh, in our framework, but b uh, without all of the complexity underneath. And we just upgrade this particular project, run this small set of tests, and see if they are green or not. If they are green, then we can upgrade everything and verify that it's working. But otherwise, we don't do it. Or try to work around it, etc. It's more easier approach. You can do it for WebDriver, for APM, or for any third party tool that you use. Of course, there are many features that uh, we don't try to test at all. Not test at all. We don't try to out automate them. For example, uh, as you see here, this video recording attribute, we have such a functionality in our framework that allows to uh, re record the um, test execution. And if the test fails, it will keep the video recording. However, this is doable to be automated. However, it's like, uh, I guess it will be too complex of a test. And uh, such kind of uh, features uh, in our framework, we actually, in our company, we're uh, like an uh, automation hub that different companies hired us to automate their projects. So we use our framework day to day to test some applications. And we use these troubleshooting uh, features ourselves. And if the, for example, videos uploaded to Azure are not working or, or anything, I will see it immediately. And there is no, no need to, to write some complex, fragile tests to, to verify that the video recording is working or not. Uh, something similar for the UI installer, like definitely you can write, and I wrote in the past tests that verify that the installer is installing everything. However, we prefer to test it manually. Uh, we have this uh, checklist with what needs to, to be checked, etc., because it's a visual thing. Like, again, we can use SQL or something, whatever, to verify it. But again, I think this type of test will be like uh, too complex uh, and no need. Like, we just do it uh, once before a major release to verify that it's working or not. What about the upgradability testing? I, so I told you about our uh, like warning tests. We use them to verify that uh, we see if something is working or not. Uh, there are uh, two cases if you see that something is wrong. For example, it's easy in WebDriver because there uh, many of the things can be worked around using JavaScript or whatever until the bug is fixed. In APM, it's a bit different, a bit harder. Like, again, you can use Espresso or ADB or low level stuff like that to work around something, but uh, not every time is doable. Uh, if something cannot be fixed uh, and work around like this, we just submit a book uh, to the GitHub maintainers and try to help them to resolve the issue or not. Um, about our API, as you know, as every API, uh, it evolves over time. However, uh, we here, th this is a code copied from the official C-sharp bindings uh, for WebDriver. As you can see here, this obsolete attribute, it marks that this particular um, method will be deprecated in a few versions. We do the same for our own framework. Like, we don't delete or change the API immediately. Uh, with this obsolete attribute, we notify our users that this method will be changed, removed, etc. And in this message there in the string, uh, we just uh, point when the feature will be removed, how it will be changed, and what needs to be done to uh, migrate to the new version. And it's actually the same approach for the official APM and WebDriver bindings. What about the inst inst installability testing? I told you about our UI installer. This is how actually common line installers work in uh, .NET world, like typing these two commands. The first one will install a template. The second one will create in an empty folder the whole project. Uh, instead of, again, manually testing everything, for the sake of verifying everything, we created uh, separate builds for each of these templates to make sure that uh, actually there is something in the template and that, and, um, that it's buildable. Because uh, sometimes there are bugs, of course, in our release tool. 
And once, uh, like a year ago, there was a case where all of the templates were empty. And our clients were, what? I cannot install it. And because of that, we created uh, separate builds for each particular uh, template to be verified that you can uninstall it, install it, and verify that it's buildable. You can see here the definition of what means portability testing. Uh, in the case of test automation frameworks, it means for me that when you write a test for a particular browser or for a particular Android version, you can change the version or you can change the browser and the test should continue to work. And we strive to give this possibility for our users. Um, in order to do so, we uh, have these attributes in making, uh, like, uh, we try to support at least three versions uh, of the browsers and a couple of versions of Android. And we make sure that this is compatible. You can see here uh, the official definition of what means interoperability testing. Uh, this is basically how your program is operating together with other applications. In our case, uh, as I told you, we have lots of integrations with the for example, Visual Studio ID, like uh, providing these pre-configured projects, uh, <coughs> templates for creating automatically page objects and stuff like that. So we need to make sure that all of these integrations are working uh, when you install the product. But again, you can, like, for example, you can use WinApp driver to automate all of this, but uh, I bet that the tester like, can get a little bit fragile and because of that, we use it just day to, in our day-to-day -day work. And this is how we test it. We, we don't automate this particular thing. Uh, we also do performance testing. Like, as you can see here, this timeout attribute, this is especially useful for, um, we run it especially for iOS tests, which uh, when you run them in simulator on Mac machine in the cloud, it can get quite slow. And because of that, we strive to test that uh, we don't uh, add some kind of a regression performance issues during our updates and make sure that at least they are on um, in a couple of seconds. Uh, when you put the, this timeout attribute, if the test is running uh, more than the specified time, the test will fail. This is the whole reason. Um, another type of testing that we do this is like a decompiler for .NET DLLs. As mentioned, uh, for the, our official packages, uh, we run this uh, third-party obfuscation tool that actually when you decompile the code, it gets quite, quite ugly. And all of the strings, etc., are like encrypted and you cannot see it. Like again, uh, you can automate this and verify that the code is ugly. But instead of making this kind of complex test, again, we just open from time to time some of the packages and verify that the obfuscator is doing its job. And f as long for the licensing stuff, we just have unit and integration tests. What about the usability and the stability of the API? Well, uh, we do alpha and beta testing. We just, uh, when we have a new version of the framework, we give it to uh, chosen experts uh, from the field. They start using it and give us feedback. This is one way to do it. Another way to do it is uh, that uh, in the past, we have hired um, like their specialized companies in uh, like evaluating the API usability of the framework. They usually work with a network of uh, consultants and domain experts. They try to use the API or the library uh, for a week or two. And then afterwards, they generate a report with feedback and suggestions, etc., and then send it to you. Uh, and even if you have these great features, if uh, your users are not using them, then your product is useless. Um, and because of that, we, how we handle the suitability? We do client interviews. This is quite important for us. Like uh, when we have the chance, we just do client users' interviews, asking the people what are their problems, whether we can solve them with the framework, or if we cannot, how they suggest that or what we can do for them. If we cannot ask them in person or during a call, 
we usually use like uh, questionnaires, feedback forms, etc., um, to to ask the same questions. And uh, during time, uh, over time, with uh, all of this feedback, the API um, like evolves and helps uh, more of our customers. And last but not least, uh, I bet that most of you have some kind of a custom framework, especially more experienced of you. And uh, I bet that you spend countless hours teaching your new colleagues how to write the tests or use the framework, etc. because most of these frameworks are not documented well. Uh, and I think that there should be a more automated approach how you can ease the learning process and allow people to learn by themselves. One way we try to solve this problem is by providing these so-called starter kits or getting started guides uh, for each particular technology. For example, we have such for web, uh, mobile, Android, iOS, etc. What is it? Uh, this is basically a project that contains uh, and explains how each feature of the framework is working. Like you see uh, on the slide, you can see that there are detailed description uh, with real-world examples, explaining with comments what is happening, how you can change it, how it works, etc. But moreover, uh, they are structured in a like in a prioritized way, where you build on top of each feature. And before proceeding to the next feature, there is this to-do text file, which contains specific exercises that you can try to do yourself, so that you can keep up with learning um, how the tool is working. Um, and especially important here is to verify, as with any documentation, that there are no syntax, grammar, etc. Uh, errors. We use tools such as Grammarly to check all of this stuff automatically for us. And also we have this static analysis tool. As mentioned, we use StyleCop and Editor Config to make sure that uh, all of our team members are following the high quality code standards. And uh, both tools are working in a similar manner, like um, as you can see below, when you build the project, if uh, some of the code is not following the guidelines. You will see these warnings uh, in the error list window. You can double click uh, on them and the problem code will be highlighted explaining what went wrong and how you can fix it. Um, I, I, I'm sure that uh, there are similar tools for Java and for other languages. This is not something specific for uh, .NET. So we went through what is the difference between a library and a framework. I told you about our tools, how we release them, how we uh, use the branching. Uh, I showed you most of the code here. It's about our framework and it's in C-sharp. But uh, because of that, I structured it in, in a way how it's in I2B or stuff like that, where uh, you can get the idea about the different types of tests. And you can do these types of tests in your custom frameworks as well. Or at least you can apply the warning tests or the getting started guides. Uh, a little bit um, of resources. Um, most of the types of the tests, uh, there are detailed articles about them uh, on my blog, automatethepoint.com. You can get expert about some of the features of the framework in the uh, official documentation. And about stuff like installers, new get packages, uh, templates, etc. There are really uh, detailed articles on MSDN. Thank you. If you have questions, I can answer. Um, uh, what do you mean by any platform? Yeah, it's, it, it uses uh, APM under the hood, so. Uh, there were examples uh, for Android and iOS as well. So. so I can see actually more on the Android side, not on iOS. There were one example for iOS, but yeah. So how we can instrument uh, for the iOS automation in uh, your framework? Uh, it's easy. You just, uh, I will, if you want, after the presentation, I can show you some examples. But basically, it's the same way how it's 
than in Android. Like most of our framework is using these uh, attributes. For Android, it's like Android app. For iOS, it's just iOS app. And under the hood, we use the different drivers to, to manage all of the stuff. But we strive uh, to make the API similar for both Android and iOS so that it's more easy for the people to, to write tests. For example, if you um, learn how to write tests for web or for Android, it will be almost the same for iOS. This is part of what we do in the framework. But all EXE will not work on iOS, right? It will work on iOS too. Executables, .exe file. Sorry? .exe file. We cannot install on Mac, right? Um, no, you can run the tests and write them on Mac. No, it is a .dmg file. Sorry? What setup? setup? Whatever setup you showcase in the presentation, it was more towards .exe. You have installed and you did all these activities, right? The framework go back, back, back. Yeah. This one? Back, back. Yes. <clears throat> go front. Yeah. One. Are you talking about this or more? more? Uh, yes, uh, actually, showcase uh, .exe. Yeah, yeah, be there, yeah. This one? Yes. Yeah, this is not running on uh, Mac, but on Mac, you can use this one. Like, uh, th these are special uh, common line installers uh, distributed through NuGet packages, okay. and they are written on .NET Core, and because of that, the, the tool can be run on .NET Core. This is how uh, standard .NET Core applications are working right now. And they work on both Linux, Mac, and Windows. Okay, thank you. But yeah, you don't have the visual in store just because you don't, like uh, the plugin system uh, in Visual Studio for Mac, it's uh, completely different than the, uh, than the one for Windows. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Uh, I have a question about why you create this uh, uh, release automation tool because like Jenkins or like Azure DevOps already have like that kind of release or publishing the uh, release automation tool. Yeah, you're right. Uh, because of that, we, as mentioned, we have this release automation in Azure already. Uh, this was like um, our old style of doing it before moving to Azure. Mm. Like, um, yeah, it was a, a bit easier uh, like years ago to, to use this visual tool uh, so that uh, we can manage in distributing it faster. Right now, we just have builds for that. Yeah, and we use the common line version of the tool. Uh, any more questions? Okay, thank you. We can you. Uh, we can talk during the pauses. Thank you.